Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, we're going to slay your toaster's inner dragon. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson. As always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Today, we welcome two guests to teach us how parents can reframe conflict. Diane Dirks is a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as the executive director of Center for Navigating Family Change, a nonprofit that provides court order parenting education and co-parenting services in the great state of Georgia. Rick Voiles is CEO of the Center for Dispute Solutions, as well as a certified business coach and anger management specialist and professional mediator. Together, they are co-authors of I Am Non-Impossible, a 12-week journey to co-parenting peace and co-host of the podcast, Co-Parent Dilemmas, now in its third season. Diane and Rick, welcome to the toaster. Hey, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. You know, Pete, that's what they all say at the beginning of the show. <laughs> is thanks for having And at the end, they're like, I, I don't know. And <laughs> I'm kind of ready to go. This has been fine. <laughs> no, that's not true. We love no. talking to people uh, about this subject. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's a good subject. And I, I feel like let's just to set the set the table, so to speak. Uh, let's let's talk about it. We're here to talk about uh, co-parenting, conflict in co-parenting. And I, I want to just set the framework for the things that you all are talking about, both in the podcast and your book and kind of how you, what is the framework around conflict in co-parenting? So what are, what are some of the reasons you find two parents run into conflict when parenting together? And when does that start? Like b- before the divorce <laughs> even <laughs> proceedings are even launched? Pete, it starts when you're discussing naming the child. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> or, or having children? I don't know. <laughs> you missed the wedding planning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Here's, right. I mean, I think this is a matter of opinion, right? But I think that when you're married, you have, or when you're together in a relationship, whether you're married or not, you have leverage, right? You know, if I want you to make me dinner tonight, I better do something for you. If you want me to have sex with you tonight, I better do something for you. So, you know, relationships are all about negotiation. And so in the marriage, sometimes we're good at it, sometimes we're not. But I think as soon as divorce papers are filed or someone decides I don't want to be in this relationship anymore, the leverage kind of goes away. So then suddenly it's each man for himself or each woman for herself. And then the conflict begins because the only thing we have in common are these two, these children that we've made. And they're very near and dear to our hearts. And I kind of want you to go away so I can have this relationship with my child. That's the, I think, the human nature part of it. But we're all smart enough to know that we can't just do that once we've had a child with somebody else. The law tells us that they're worthy to at least, you know, be in that child's life. And so I think that's where the conflict really begins when it comes to co-parenting. I am really surprised to hear the words leverage in there. That that's I I love that. I love that. Yeah, I think that's perfect. It, it is all about leverage and about negotiation. And if you don't have the skills to do it, then you're going to be bad at it either in the relationship or through the divorce. We all know that parents do parent differently, even when they're in a relationship, not getting a divorce. What I always say is in divorce, any personality trait becomes very heightened. If you're anxious by nature, you're super anxious. If you watch every dime, now you watch every penny. And your individual parenting styles become heightened. And if they don't align, which they often do not, then the other side will be just pointing out what they perceive to be deficiencies. You know, once we're co-parenting, we feel that we now have the right to finally do parenting the way we want to, because maybe in the marriage or in the relationship, I deferred to your parenting style because I felt maybe you had a little more power in the relationship, or I just let you be the disciplinarian because I didn't want to fight with you about it. Now that I'm on my own, I can finally parent the way I want to. And sometimes that does go to an extreme. I am going to finally discipline these kids like they should have been, and I might go overboard with that or vice versa. You know, these kids have been little soldiers around the other parent, I'm going to finally let them do whatever they want so they can feel some freedom. And maybe because I want to be the 
a better liked parent. And so all of those factors become very complicated, I think, after divorce. It feels to me like what all three of you have just said is conflict comes from the the point where your activities become uh, examined under a microscope. And therefore, it seems like peace should come from ignorance. <laughs> Could we just <laughs> yeah. stop looking so hard at each other? Maybe we'd be able to find some peace. Well, I think that's true, Pete. But in a relationship, when you're raising children, what happens is, we all take on these sort of roles in the household. The stereotypical 1950s, man makes the money, woman runs the house, but wait till dad gets home. Like if you're not happy, you know, if you're not listening to me, wait till dad gets home and he's the enforcer. Okay. Now there's all sorts of permutations of that very simplistic analysis that I just did in relationships when you're together and kids know, I, I mean, Literally, I was talking to my son and his, or my soon to be stepson as well. And we were sitting around and it was during COVID. And we said, well, which out of the numerous parents and step parents in your lives is the most strict about COVID rules? And they immediately said who it was. They both said it. And who's the lightest? Like the kids know better than we do what they can get away with, with what parent. And in a divorce, that also becomes heightened. My hunch is that's going to be different. That that could be different between parents and kids. Like if you have two kids, those relationships are are different too. And I'm I'm only sort of putting that on my own. I've got two kids, and I think they we I have a different relationship with each of them, and they manipulate me differently <laughs> than they manipulate my wife in unique ways. <laughs> One of the things we used to talk about, I don't know if they still do in the classes that we taught, was that you know. Most parents have a favorite child and, you know, everybody says, oh, no, no, that's not true. I don't have a favorite. But if you pose the question like this, uh, if you had to be on a deserted island with one of your children, you would pick one. Well, not right now. Not right For now. the record, I certainly won't. <laughs> but if you gave a different scenario, who would you rather go, you know, uh, on a hiking trip with, you know, that might be a different child or who would you rather go get your nails done with? That might be a different child. And I've posed that question to children in my office before when they ask me, I've had kids ask me, is it okay that I would rather live with my dad than my mom? Will that be hurting my mom? And I would say, of course not. That, that means that you have a unique relationship with your dad. And I always tell them that story. But if uh, I've asked that to parents, which child would you choose? And they always laugh and say, oh, I know she would choose my sister because my sister is this way and I'm that way. So you're exactly right. I think kids are really smart about that, but they feel bad if they do have an affinity toward one parent over the other. And what we know, what the research tells us, the affinity is not bad. It's okay that you have an affinity towards one of your parents. What we don't like is when that affinity begins to turn into some sort of um, alienation or the affinity goes a little bit too far where I now feel like I have to protect my parent somehow from the other parent. And then that moves into something a little bit more nefarious, which is, you know, I need to now reject one of my parents, but there's nothing wrong with affinity. And I think it's important that kids know that. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to be on a deserted island, everybody knows. Everybody in my family would pick my daughter. She's the one who's most capable of surviving. If it's like stuck in a movie theater with movies and junk food, yeah, it'd be my son. Right, right, right. Uh, he's just better at it than she <laughs> yeah. is. What if you're stuck in a movie theater on an island? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just... I don't know about that. Oh, God. <laughs> Sad. I'm going to be thinking about that all day. Uh uh, but it, it does lead us to this question of reframing uh, co-parenting. And y you actually, in, in, as we were kind of sharing notes on on what we wanted to talk about today, uh, you brought up the idea of wanting to share the dragon concept around reframing co-parenting, conflict and co-parenting. And so what a great uh, time, better no better time than right now to introduce what is the, what is dragon and how can we unleash it on co-parenting? Co unleash it. I think I like it more thinking of it as slaying the dragon. The dragon kind of represents the fear that we have. And so sometimes it's kind of like um, when you're a child and there's a monster under the bed and you're crying and fearful and your parents kind of take you and look under the bed and, 
maybe spray some dragon spray on it to make sure or some monster spray to make sure the monster goes away. We have to face it in order for the fear to kind of dissipate. And so Rick and I were just kind of talking about how do we process co-parent conflict, both in our offices when we're doing, you know, staff meetings or when we're doing the podcast and we get a listener question, how do we, what are the steps that we take? And we sort of outlined it this way and then just came up with a letter for each each of the steps that we take. But Rick, do you want to um, do you want to talk a little bit about each step, and then we can chat about it as we go? Yeah, the first step is dilemma for the D and Dragon. What we're looking at the first letter in Dragon is D. We call the dilemma. We want you to describe the dilemma, the, the conflict that's going on between you. Just give it a, a simple description. What's going on? And then R is reframe it. Consider alternative explanations for what's happening. It's impossible to describe it without assigning some sort of motive. And so that motive, we want you to kind of, uh, you kind of benefit of the doubt. Could there be another way to explain why this is happening or another way uh, to explain what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish? And that's probably the hardest step to look at it differently because you know how it feels. You know the history. We automatically fall into, oh, I know what's going on here. But if you can reframe it just a little bit in order to give for a momentary benefit of the doubt, it expands the possibilities later on. Then we look at A, which is anxiety. If you can identify what's driving your fear, what is it that you are afraid is going to happen if something doesn't change? Then we go to the goal. All right. I don't want that fear to happen. So then what's my goal? What's my goal for myself? But also, more importantly, what's my goal for my child in this conflict? Because we want to keep it child focused as the motivation. Once I've set my goal, then I can look at opportunities, the O. How can I formulate a plan that will accomplish the goal for my child that I have for my child? a goal that will meet my child's need despite and regardless what the other parent does. And we call that having a plan B available. So that's what you're formulating. And then the N in Dragon is decide now, where are your boundaries? Now you have a clear idea of what your goal is. You also have an idea of an alternative that you can employ if the other parent will not agree, a basic negotiation technique. I know where I'm going to go. I know what I'm going to do for my child that will meet my child's need. And then you decide, all right, now I can negotiate. But you've got, you're in a better negotiating position. You're not trapped in a corner. The other parent doesn't have ultimate power. Your plan B, your opportunity, literally empowers you to negotiate basically without losing if your child's need can be met. So the example. Let me. Yeah, let's get to an example, because <laughs> okay. I got a lot of stuff going through my head. Like <laughs> sure. that sounds good when you are Ph.D. <laughs> studying this stuff. But when you got to put it into action in through a text or whatever the case may be, how you're communicating let, let's put some meat on, on, on the bones of this uh, awesome outline that you got here. Let's say right off the bat, let's not react with the text. <laughs> okay. You, unless somebody's, you know, life is in danger, it really is okay to step away and think through this. But one of my favorite examples, and we have many, many of them, but um, was a mom that was in one of our advanced classes that we were teaching. And she said, oh, I've got a great plan B. And she said she was so frustrated for the longest time that her son, when he would go to his dad's house, his dad would never take him to birthday parties. And he was at that age, I don't know, seven, eight years old, where every kid's having multiple birthday parties to go to every weekend. And this one particular birthday birthday party was with his best friend. And she really wanted him to be able to go, but it wasn't happening on her weekend. So she uh, begged and cajoled the other parent, you know, Johnny's birthday, best friend is having a birthday party. Please, please take him. It's so important to him. I'll even pick him up, you know, right before it and bring him back right after. I'll even go to Walmart and buy the gift and blah, blah, blah. And she just was so motivated. And 
obviously he he wanted control the other parent and so he got some sort of thrill i think out of saying the no and so he said no it's my time johnny's not going to the birthday party but she said what occurred to her was that if i figure out what it is that johnny really needs instead of what i want dad to do to fulfill johnny's needs then maybe i could work through this myself And she did something very simple. She decided when the son came home and gave her the invitation for the best friend, he said to her, and dad probably won't let me go, right? Because it's his weekend. And she said, well, we can ask. But I'll tell you what, if dad says no, then we will plan a special party the weekend after or whenever he's available with your friend. And he can come over and we'll have a sleepover and we'll make a cake and we'll have your own birthday party with him. And she said, his eyes lit up. Now, that's not a perfect solution. He still doesn't get to be with all of the friends. But when I heard that, my first thought was, that kid will remember that the rest of his life. That mom said, I can't control what dad decides to do. But we can still make sure that you can honor your friend with a birthday party, even if it's not the best way or the perfect way. It is a way rather than fighting with your dad. And it released her from the anxiety of it. It maybe even released the kid from some of the anxiety. Well, if I can't go, we'll just have some friends over and we'll have a second birthday party for my friend. And we can think of multiple examples where if you really think through, what's my child's need here? And I can figure out, we had one dad who said his ex planned or she had final say on activities and because she was trying, he, his perception was she was trying to keep him away from the activity. So she signed him up for baseball, you know, 50 minutes away from where dad worked and lived. And he could have gotten frustrated about that. He could have taken her back to court and said, this is wrong. You know, we sh- you should plan activities that I can attend. But because of his work, work schedule and all that, he wasn't able to attend. So what he did was he had a conversation with his son. He didn't blame mom. He just said, listen, because of my work and where I live, I'm not going to be able to come to all your baseball games. However, I found another mom on the team who's willing to take a video of you every time you're up to bat or when you're in the outfield. And she's going to send me those videos. And then when you come over, we're going to look at them together and we're going to talk about your what what's happening or we're going to practice in the front yard. And right away, he said, I didn't feel constrained by my ex-wife anymore. I knew what I could do, regardless of what she decided to do, to make sure that my son knew I cared about his baseball. I call that a workaround. I think those are brilliant ideas, just because you, you can't push a rope. You can't make someone do something they don't want to do, especially when their leverage with you is to get under your skin. And it really, it, it really is what about what the kid needs from you as a parent. Well, and I, and I, I appreciate what that, like all of these, uh, both of these examples are, are terrific examples of, of how to employ the, the sort of mindset, like to change it, to flex that muscle of focusing on the kids, getting out of the heart of conflict. But I can't help but land in that zone of, Divorce is an adversarial process. And what if you're employing that flexed muscle in an engagement where your partner still deeply wants to get under your skin? I'm going to challenge that a little bit. The legal divorce is set up as an adversarial process. The fact that we haven't implemented a different way in a legal system to get people divorced as opposed to plaintiff, defendant, so to speak, it's petitioner yeah, respondent, fair. but that's, that's, fair. that it's, you know, in, in us in the, in the ivory towers and like, well, let's call it in Ray, the marriage of Jones and Jones, because we think putting a V in there instead of an and is going to make all the difference. And it does not. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, they thought when you called it time sharing and not custody and visitation that, oh, things would get better. And they do not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but there is the. Oh, no. Mm, People saw through it. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. Yes. You know. Shock. There is law yeah. going on in this establishment. Well, Rick, why don't you say something a little bit about the. Um, communication protocol, because the reframe that that Rick talked about a little bit with regard to considering alternatives 
is not so much giving your parent the benefit of the doubt and, and try to making them a nice person in your brain when you know they're not. It really is about how do I communicate? And you want to say a little bit about that, Rick? Well, the primary way for them to get under your skin is how they communicate with you. And we we promote what we call a structured email protocol so that we are literally organizing our communication with each other in a business-like way. So we're scheduling like a business meeting. The email protocol says that we're going to talk to each other about what's coming up for the kids this week once a week. I have one email, you have one email. Each email has a structure. There is an FYI section and there is an RR section, RR standing for requested response. And then we train uh, the high conflict co-parents how to implement this tool so that I don't have to answer your texts during the day because now if I have this protocol in the court order, I now have permission from the court to ignore all of your texts throughout the week, all of your voicemails that are accusing me and dehumanizing and abusing me. I can just ignore those until the email protocol comes up. Let's say Sunday night, nine o'clock. I send you mine. Then you send me 24 hours yours. And by structuring that communication in such a way People start to begin to literally pull apart. They start to figure out how to live their lives separately and parent parallel with each other. Uh, The result is we often get, man, I finally got some space away from that other parent. I finally was able to develop and cultivate some peace of mind simply because I was scheduled. Right. And Rick, you, you, you mentioned a key term is like, this is more like a parallel parenting as opposed to co-parenting. So these, Pete, are high conflict cases Correct. where it's Monday. No, it's Tuesday. It's rainy. No, it's sunny. It, yeah, it's right. In, in you're just n- neither parent for this. I'm just going to put it on both of them. They are not going to be able to make decisions that maybe objectively speaking would be in the best interest of the child. There's too much in the conflict. So basically, Johnny's at your house, you do your deal. Johnny's at my house, I do my deal. And we communicate as little as possible Yes, to get the most basic need to know information across. And that's that. That's it. And that seems like it flies directly in the face of a child-centered approach to divorce. Not if you assume or accept what we do, the the research seems to indicate that it's the conflict that hurts the children. It's not the divorce that hurts the children. Two parents living two separate lives. I mean, much of our society is organized around one parent being gone most of the day. Yeah, we're already doing it. Right, right. right. So if it's conflict that hurts the child, what do we need to do to minimize or eliminate? And that's right, Pete. And to your point, Pete, is it does seem counterintuitive in the sense that, hey, we're not really acting in the best interest of the child. We're taking the first step that we're not going to expose our child to conflict. That's different than saying we're not going to expose our child to conflict and we're going to do all these great things together as parents. We're going to sit together at their shows. We're going to make sure that the stepdad is invited to dad's breakfast at school. We're going to, you know, flop days or just, hey, your parents are in town and it's my weekend. It's important for my son to see his grandparents. Go. I'm not even going to ask for makeup time. Like, that's the gold standard, right? (laughs) But the issue is there's only, we know that only 20 to 30 percent of co-parents can do what you just described, though. So we've got to deal with the other 70 percent and we know nah, about- fuck them. Let them figure it out by themselves. I'm tired of this today. <laughs> <laughs> all those poor kids. Yes. 20 and 30% all day long. And I, I also will tell you, there's absolutely no research, none, that I can find and anyone's pointed me to that says that kids who have parents who do the parallel style fare any worse in the long run than kids who have a more cooperative style. So the key seems to be no conflict kids are okay. Kids know their parents don't like each other or they wouldn't be divorced. So kids have pretty low expectations. 
kids don't expect you to be best friends after divorce, but they do need you to let them be kids and not be all wrapped up in the adult stuff. So the way, the visual that I like to use between parallel and cooperative, cooperative is like two intersecting circles, right? And our kid is in the middle and we're intersecting with each other. Parallel is a ladder. We're each the side of the ladder and the rungs are very strategically placed and they're placed at intervals that are uh, regular and predictable so that in order to move up the ladder, we have that communication once a week, once a week. Even if no one has anything to say, you still write the email. I have nothing. I have nothing. Great. We're both doing great with our kids. We don't need to talk to each other. And yeah, it's not for everybody, but it's for a lot of the parents out there that can achieve, achieve the cooperative. Wow. Well, and I totally get that G. Like if if you start with the, going through this dragon process, even if you have nothing specific to to deal with, but you know there is a generalized conflict between the two of you as you're getting a divorce, starting with the G of freeing the child from living with your conflict, everything else s- sort of it gives you a new field on which to play. I, I really appreciate that. And along with this, we do a lot of coaching on how to communicate, giving the other parent the benefit of the doubt, not because you believe it, but because it inspires the other parent to want to communicate with you. So the example we always use is the dad who writes mom an email and Johnny said, you're not brushing his teeth, you know, every night. And Johnny's going to have cavities by the time he's 12 or gingivitis. And the American Dental Association's website says such and so, and you need to read it. (laughs) And we've had these parents where, you know, they're all knowing I'm, you know, I'm the king of co-parenting. I know what I'm doing and you need to listen to me. And that just simply doesn't work. So we try to tell people, stop what doesn't work and let's try something different that might work, which if dad would, even though dad thinks mom's a horrible, neglectful parent and Johnny's teeth do look like they're about ready to fall out, he still needs to say, hey, dear mom, Johnny said he's not brushing your teeth at your house. I doubt that's true, but I'm just letting you know in case he's trying to manipulate us. What a great way to open a conversation with someone. You're not only letting them know, hey, I got your number, but you're doing it in a way that says, we're a team here, and Johnny could be manipulating us. I'm going to just throw this idea out there. She's at least more likely to read it than the other email where he's kind of saying, and you know, you need to go to this website and read how to be a parent. She's done. (laughs) She's done. Right. I've got two points on this, though. The most important point of my two is the Dental Association show will be in the show notes, that link. So if you don't know how to brush your kid's (laughs) teeth and when to floss, I'm sure Pete will put that in there. No one will read it. (laughs) Oh, we we got like 70% of the parents that are going to be jumping on that. You know, yeah. Um, (laughs) Well, you know, you only heard one part of what I said. You didn't hear the second part. (laughs) I'm getting there. I'm getting there. The other part, which I do think is important, is that when you receive that email, you cannot go to your kid and say, don't tell dad what's happening at my house. Right. The way that I always teach my clients how to deal with that is. Just the opposite. You can tell the parent anything that goes on in this house. And that's fine because guess what? We talk. You don't think we talk, but we talk. And when you say one thing over there and another thing over there, in fact, we talk now more than when we talked when we were married and living in the same house. Mm -hmm. So watch your back. And and when you do that, and, and my son, ever since we've been divorced, he was two and a half, we always said, You can tell mom anything that happens in my house, except if it's a surprise party for mom or you're getting her a gift, you know, let her wait on that. But other than that, it's free reign, you know? Yeah. The only, the only rule I have about that with kids, I say kids come to you because they're trying to manipulate or sometimes because they need to vent. And so if your child is venting about the other parent, those are not things you want to go and tell the other parent. So I think you need to be very clear with your child. Are you wanting me to help you with this problem that you're having with your other parent? 
um, I'm limited, but I'll try. Or are you just venting because I'm not going to share your vent with the other parents so that they do feel like they can come to you and talk about what's painful. That's the that's the corollary to the island thing, right? Parent, the kids pick us, too, for different reasons, just like we might. Yes, exactly. Hey, Pete, I know you've heard this before, but according to the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, about 10% of kids live with a parent with an alcohol use disorder. That's uh, got to be hard to hear as an attorney, as somebody with the best interests of kids uh, at, at heart uh, in, in your practice, Seth. And I, I think it's such a, a great opportunity for us to talk about our very favorite partner uh, it, who aligns with us in our mission to keep kids safe with sober parents. If you have a problem with alcohol in your divorce, who are you going to call? Well, Soberlink's been great. And I mean, we've talked about it before, but what's really amazing is it's a little device in someone's hand that you can blow into with facial recognition, which can only be used in court. So you can't go post the picture of someone blowing in the device on social media. You put in the court order or the stipulation. It will be only used in court to prove or disprove whether you are the one blowing into the device, but it provides real-time, third-party, independent verification that you're not drinking. And if you're doing that, that means your kids are safe when they're with you. And then you can spend quality time with them. You do that for six months, eight months, 12 months, whatever the case may be. It's hard for the other side to go to the judge and say you have a problem when you're showing this independent third-party verification in real time that there isn't a problem. Reducing anxiety for everyone. That real-time verification is huge. You know your kids are safe. Your co-parent knows your kids are safe. Your legal team knows your kids are safe. And that's it. This remote alcohol monitoring tool has helped over 500,000 people prove their sobriety and provide peace of mind during parenting time. And we love Soberlink because they have partnered with us and are offering a discount for you to get started. You can get started with, if you're in the US, you can get a cellular model that doesn't need a phone at all. You just blow into it and it goes straight up into the, uh, sending all the notifications where the notifications need to be. You can also get a Wi-Fi model, pairs with your phone, does the same thing. Uh, And you can get 50 bucks off to get started right off your device at soberlink.com slash toaster. That's soberlink.com slash toaster. If you're dealing with this in your divorce, you got to have all the data. Thank you so much to Soberlink for partnering with How to Split a Toaster. So I'm going to back way up because you said something at the beginning and then we jumped into Dragon, which is awesome. But you said about fear. People are going to start to do this to get over their fear. So many people are just fearful. They're fearful of the communication. They freeze up. They don't want to move forward with the divorce because they're fearful of the outcome or they don't want it. And, and do you have any tips on how they can face that fear? Because the first step you said is describe the dilemma, what's going on between you, but there's the individual in that on how do they even just, man, take the deep breath and I got to go deal with this now. I think it's different for everybody because it depends on the nature of the relationship. You know, there's people out there that were physically or emotionally abused by their partner. This is a lot harder (laughs) to send a text, write an email because you're going to, there's triggers. And for many of those parents, probably some individual therapy is what is needed, right? To figure out what to do with that trauma what to, how to respond to the triggers, remind ourselves that we took and made the best boundary possible and that was leaving the relationship. Oh, I tell people that all the time. The bravest thing you've ever done was file for divorce. Right, but then oftentimes people feel empowered by that and then they decide they're going to finally fight. That's not a good time to start fighting. (laughs) It's a good time to (laughs) accept. We've seen- You just did something awesome. Yeah, you did Let's just celebrate that one thing. I'm never going to let him do that to me again. And from now on, I'm going to show my power. (laughs) It's my whole new me. I got a kid going to college next year. I don't know what you're talking about, not fighting. I got to fund this. (laughs) You know, we got to talk to Andy about who get on this show. (laughs) But the whole point behind Dragon was to kind of go through this mental process of why am I so afraid? When something that I would actually work with someone in therapy, what's the what's the root of that fear? Does it have to do with the past? Can I get over the fear of simply by saying, yeah, I don't live in the same house anymore. I don't have to need his approval. 
I mean, I think one of the reasons co-parent conflict is so prevalent is because we work really hard trying to make the relationship work when we're in it. We do a lot of stuff. Nobody just gets up one day and decides, I don't want to be here anymore and leaves. I mean, there's years often of therapy, reading books, fighting, having conversation after conversation till 3 a.m. And you wear yourself out in desperation to make it work. And when you finally realize it's not going to work, it's kind of hard for that battery to drain. You're still in that mode of, I still need their approval. I still need them to affirm me as a good person or a good parent. I, it's hard to let go of that. So in the therapeutic process, I'm often, help, often helping people to say, okay, I don't have to keep working so hard. I don't, this, I'm not working anymore. You know, it, it's just, so I say, take all of that, put it in a closet and let the battery die out. So Rick, on the dragon that you went through, how does a parent who gets that email that isn't as structured, it's supposed to be, it's not. And there's all these attacks. And some of them aren't about them. It's, I talked to my lawyer and you're not going to get anything. And, and the person reading that is now fearful. They believe it. And they call me and I say, you tell me that he says all these things that are lies all the time, but you believe the things that are negative like that. So is there a spot in the dragon to either eliminate or reframe what they're saying to you when they're doing those attacking emails? One of the tools that we implement, we have mantras that we encourage parents to respond to. So if someone comes to me and, and tells me what you just, just described, I would suggest, well, first of all, talk to your attorney if you're still in the divorce process. But don't defend yourself to them or, or disagree. Just uh, if they accuse you of something, defend yourself on a separate document. Don't send it back to them because all they're going to do is, well, they hooked you. They're going to just continue to argue with you. Defend what really happened or the, the, describe the circumstance and then send that to your lawyer. If they need it, they can use it. If not, then fine. But the response then to the other parent is a mant one of the mantras that I used a lot that was helpful for me was, well, thanks for letting me know. I'll take that into consideration. And no matter how many times they attack me or tell me their opinion or try to abuse me, well, thanks for letting me know that. Uh, they come back and say, you know, your mom was right about you. You suck. And you write back, well, thanks for letting me know. I'll take that into consideration. And no matter what they say, then I take it to my attorney and go, okay, now what do I do with this? Do I need to respond to this? But you And your attorney says, mantras. your mom told me the same thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I say, thanks for letting me know, and I won't help. <laughs> <laughs> but the mantras can be very helpful. They, our, what we teach and what we promote is healthy divorcing boundaries. Where do I stop and, and where do I begin? Where do you end and where do you, so that they're not overlapping. I'm not crossing your boundaries, but I'm not going to allow you anymore to plow through my boundaries. And a really good, I think, cognitive behavioral therapy tool for people that I use all the time, but you don't have to be in therapy to use this tool. I have them get a three by five card and on the one side, write the lie. The lie in the scenario you gave, um, Seth, was you know, my attorney said, you're going to lose everything. That's right. So you write that down on one side of the card. My attorney says, I'm going to lose everything. You turn the card over and write the truth. And you may need to consult with a few people like your coach or your therapist or your best friend or whoever knows the situation. But the truth is, can he really take everything from me? Um, what have I done that a court would say, yes, you deserve nothing? Probably very little. Just the way you frame that, people say that to me all the time. Well, what did I do where that might happen? And I'm like, nothing. nothing. Yeah. And and like literally they say, well, I had an affair. How is that going to impact it? Now, under Florida statute, if you have an affair, it could impact alimony. I've never had one judge apply that to a case. Yeah. I've never heard of a judge applying that to a case. And so I tell them, Here's the deal. You could have been having sex with this person on the kitchen table. And as long as your kid wasn't there watching, you're good. It's not right. going to impact the case. Right. right? right. 
So it's not always about what you did or didn't do. Sometimes the law just doesn't care. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the truth is what I try to teach is the truth that you know to be true. And if you're not sure, check it out and have people tell you what the truth is uh, to affirm you. The truth will always outweigh the lie. And so you, every time you have that feeling of fear, you look up, ah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose everything. You turn that card over and you say it out loud. You keep saying it till your brain believes it. And that's how the neuropathways in the brain actually begin to change and get rid of the fear uh, out of your head. The conflict, I, I say this supporting your point, conflict thrives on inertia, right? Like conflict thrives on you not doing that. Conflict thrives on you getting that email and reacting to it before you slow down. And I just want to say that while celebrating Dragon is a long enough acronym to make you slow down. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right? Like part of part of it is just stop so and I have reflect this for us. <laughs> right. This is my little stress second. <laughs> stress yeah. Dragon. I, yes. <laughs> Link to Amazon I, I, in the show notes. <laughs> you can find them on our, app, our website, actually. Oh, perfect. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the, the power of taking a hot second and living in fact and truth, writing down on the card, taking a moment to, to just breathe through the acronym, describe it, reframe it. Uh, what is the anxiety you're experiencing? What's your goal, opportunities, and then negotiate? Yes. That's it. Negotiate with your plan B in mind so that negotiation is mind. not a stressful um, prospect. Yeah. And I think the main thing about that negotiation on the examples you gave, because the first one about the birthday, I was thinking, yeah, that's an easy one. You can do that. All you got to do is plan it with the other, the, your best fr your kid's best friend's parents, right? Um, and I was thinking to myself, well, what happens when there's um, extracurricular activities? And that's the one you went to next. Totally reframed it. And, and the kids will appreciate that. Like, hey, I, this is a great team for you to be on. You know, you're, and, uh, but because of work, I might not be able to make the games, but it's more important for you to play. Here's how I'm going to be able to participate in that. Cause I really want to be there as much as I can. Yeah. And we'll go like, that's brilliant. Yeah. Pete, you remember we had Tammy Spar, um, amazing yeah. mediator on, and she frequently tells a story where parents lived about 30 miles from each other. Every other weekend schedule, it was actually week on, week off. And they literally signed the kid up for soccer at two different. Um, select teams. And this kid was an excellent player and rode the bench on both teams because he wasn't at practice. Yeah. And they couldn't wow. persuade either coach to put him in like, oh, it's not my fault. It's not the kid's fault. Nope. These are rules. Everyone's got to do the same. And this wow. kid later on when, you know, basically when there was a younger brother involved and they were about to do the same for him, he sat his parents down because there was a wide gap in the age between the children and said, you ruined my soccer. You're not going to do it to him. Oh, and wow. gave it to the parents on it. Right. Cool. So sometimes, you know, it takes the kids standing up for themselves, which is hard to do. Which is right? the G, the goal. Right. The goal can't be what your goal is. The goal has to be what, what are, where are my values, my parenting values? And how am I going to make sure that I still be able to execute the, execute those with my child given these difficult circumstances and that you may need to talk through that with somebody if you're not sure and you can kind of see on that that story about the soccer is just like the, you can see both parents who are in a conflicted sort of parallel divorce imagining and internalizing for themselves that they're doing the right thing by making their making sure their child is active and engaged and on a team and not being able to see that the goal the g is for the kid first. Because every time he sat on that bench, he's reminded that I wouldn't be on this bench if my parents weren't yes. such idiots. I mean, how, uh, how might that feel every especially week? Especially <laughs> when he's running circles around the guy playing his position during practice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, right. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll just say, as I, you know, I, I, I've never been divorced. And in fact, I'm going on 24 years this year. And I, I'm hearing all this and thinking, holy crap. 
I could do this right now. <laughs> this is good for me. That Hell, this is good for me with my relationship with Seth, for crying out loud. Oh, oh, let me tell you, wow. I've been Ooh. reframing. <laughs> I've been reframing all show, Pete. Do we have time for that story? I'm yeah. curious. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're we're going to have to ship out some dragons, I think, oh, for you two. You guys, so. I, seriously, you guys are fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we uh, we pitched the, the but we mentioned the book and the podcast in the intro, but please tell us a little bit more about what you two are up to and uh, uh, where people can go find your good work. Yeah, we have a book called The I Am Not Impossible. It's a journal of sorts that goes along with some of our episodes. And the reason we came up with this is that we know you might hear something on the podcast and go, that's great. I'm going to do that. It sounds good. It's kind of like hearing a commercial about a diet. And you think, of course, I'm going to do that. Of course, I'm going to stop eating the way I eat. And then five minutes later, you're off eating the chocolate cake because that's what your brain and body is telling you to do. And I think co-parent conflict is the same. So you really have to practice. And without a coach, we think that this uh, journal can help walk you through the steps of Dragon with different scenarios, thinking through what your conflict is as you listen to some of the podcast episodes. And so our goal for the journal is for people to actually use it as a practice tool to change how their brains think about conflict. Yeah, I'd love it. And uh, Rick, tell us just a little bit more about the podcast. The podcast, uh, we have this uh, concept called the impossible co-parent. And what we do in our co-parent dilemmas is give practical solutions to those impossible co-parents. And we give strategies, techniques, reframing about how to approach a situation. Someone emails us their situation, their dilemma, and then Diane and I talk through it. And then we give them the choice at the end, okay, if you hang on to this, here's what you're going to risk. If you let go of this fight or this dilemma, then here's what you're going to gain. Beautiful. Yeah, we will put uh, links to both of those things, all your good work and your uh, uh, your practices so people can learn more about you in the show notes. Scroll down, everybody, and check those out. Thank you so much uh, for your wisdom today. Uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, thank you everybody for downloading and listening to this show. We sure appreciate your time and attention. You can find us anywhere great podcasts are served, but don't forget you can also ask questions. If you have a question for Seth, uh, you want to get it answered on the show, all your legal questions about divorce and family law are welcome. Head over to howtosplitatoaster.com and just click on the ask a question button. It'll get to us and we'll get that on the show. Thanks again, everybody. On behalf of Diane Turks and Rick Boyles and Seth Nelson, America's favorite divorce attorney, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with NLG Divorce and Family Law with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of NLG Divorce and Family Law. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.